welcome to a brand new series of Reading Aloud, the programme about books and authors full of inspirational ideas for the children you teach. Well, we're kicking off this series here at the Hawthorns, the home of West Bromwich Albion. And why is a dyed-in-the-wool Arsenal fan standing here? Because this club, along with many others throughout the country, are doing some pretty remarkable work in encouraging children to read. More on that later, but first, here's a look at what's coming up in the rest of the show. A bizarre bird hunt at the Baggies ground encourages reading. Best-selling author Anthony Horowitz reveals a publishing exclusive. Uh, this is a new Diamond Brothers book. Even my publishers don't know I'm writing it. While his schoolboy super spy inspires dramatic literacy work. And there are more spies, lies and secrets with Michael Frayne. The highly paid footballers emerging from this tunnel on a Saturday afternoon may be skillful athletes at the peak of their game, but they're not generally regarded as literacy role models. But then, a few years ago, a scheme was launched challenging the view that footballers are good at reading the game, but seldom pick up a book. The aim? To turn young football fans, particularly boys, into avid readers. There's a lot more to the Hawthorns ground than football. Every week, a thousand children from neighbouring schools attend the club's community programme unit. Today, children who may be struggling with reading have to solve a mystery. West Brom's mascot, Baggy Bird, has gone missing. Their job? To track him down. The students play detective, adopting the role of Wes Bromwich, super sleuth. And, using clues hidden in a specially written story, they attempt to find the missing mascot. We're trying to engage kids uh, through the medium of football. Uh, it's a classic partnership between a football club, the local education authority and the DFES and it's bringing together all those experts in different fields to engage kids through football. It's part of a nationwide initiative called Reading the Game, run by the National Literacy Trust and the Premier League. West Bromwich and the mystery of the missing mascot uh, will take you on a literacy trail of the ground. It'll take you to various points in the ground, the executive areas that most fans don't normally get the opportunity to sit in, uh, the press area, the dugouts and even the changing rooms. The beauty of this text is that although it has all the literacy curriculum links, Pupils that come on this trail don't realise they're actually doing literacy. They are, of course, experiencing a ground tour, and some of the lucky ones even get to meet and interview a player about their reading habits. Have you got a favourite author? I like uh, J.K. Rowling for, for the Harry Potter books. Uh, they're very interesting and, and fun in reading. Uh, I want to help them out and I want to tell them what I do in my spare time. And if it's about reading and I do that, of course, I'll tell them that and hopefully they will do the same. If we can get Thomas Gardso, a footballer, to say, I read, you know, that's the sort of engagement you're looking at. That is absolutely brilliant. That tells the kids that not all football, footballers are thick. The majority of them will go away not realising they've actually completed um, a national curriculum English session, and that's what we like about it. Baggy Bird doing a sterling job here at the Hawthorns. Now you've lit the reading fuse. What books are available for use in the classroom? Well, award-winning author Anthony Horowitz has discovered that there's a huge appetite for his stories about Alex Ryder, a schoolboy super spy. Matters of national security are rarely witnessed here, but today, spooks, spies and MI6 have invaded the black country. <laughs> as a best-selling author goes on a mission to sign 500 copies of his massively popular spy and horror books in less than an hour. There we go, you. To say Anthony Horowitz is a prolific writer is an understatement. He's written 27 children's stories in the last 30 years, selling more than 20 million books. And his young fans eagerly await each new title. I am a paid liar. In fact, since I have begun talking on this stage, I have already lied to you twice. That wasn't true, OK? You see, that's what I mean. You've got, you got, you got to just sort of make it up for yourself. I, I, I write stories that I find personally entertaining and which I hope 
children broadly, and even some adults, will find entertaining too. I have strong feelings, for example, about violence in children's books. Um, there isn't enough of it, but um, th that's... Um, the genres that I write in, the spy genre and the whodunits and all the rest of it, are by their very nature mere entertainments. And it's certainly true that my role does seem to have been to get kids started to read. That's, you know, everybody's always telling me that, you know, if it wasn't for you, my children wouldn't read. It's a wonderful position to have. Afterwards, if you don't like it, kind of, Anthony is working on a new book full of good, puns right, and jokes and gave his audience an exclusive this, preview. Um, this is a new Diamond Brothers book. Even my publishers don't know I'm writing it, so nobody knows it's here except for you now. And it goes like this. It seemed that everyone in Camden Town knew I was broke. Even the turkeys were laughing at me. On the last day of term, the teachers had a whip round for me. Not that I really needed a whip, but I suppose it's a thought that counts. If I read out a chapter or a couple of pages to an audience, I can just tell from the vibe I'm getting back again whether it's working or not. Christmas was just 10 days away, and the only money I had was a £10 book token that my parents had sent me from Australia. I cannot imagine a world without all the writers that I love, from, you know, Dickens and Austin and Hardy and Gissing and Orwell. Uh, you know, these, these are the writers who have shaped my life. She smiled sadly at me. Have you tried Philip Pullman? No. Do you think he'd lend me some money? And I would love to think that somewhere out there, there is a child who might start reading Stormbreaker and discover all these other writers as an adult. So if teachers are using my books to encourage reading, I have no argument with that. Someone who's doing just that with his year eight class is Andrew Cooley, head of English at St Albans School in Birmingham. Why did Anthony Horowitz include this last paragraph in this story? He turned his back on Alex and climbed into the helicopter cabin. Behind the glass, Yassin raised his hand. A gesture of friendship, a salute. Alex raised his hand and the helicopter spun away. Why that ending? Amelia? To make the reader want to read on to the next book to find out what happens to the end of the story. OK. They took the book home and most of them had read it over the weekend, so they came in on the Monday with the book already read, a good understanding of what it was about. So then we set up a whole load of tasks for them to do, which included um, mocking up their own gadgets. Gadgets from the book? Gadgets from the book and typical spy gadgets. It's called a reversible iPad tracking device. Some wrote stories. Some chose to do uh, board games. The, the room was a hive of activity. Did he set up any kind of rivalry between Ryder and Bond? Oh, yes. We had uh, two of the boys decided that uh, they wanted to do a, a Bond versus Ryder face-off. The name's Bond. James Bond, 007. My name's Alex Ryder. Please, just call me Alex. I've been all over the world. I didn't give them uh, Ian Fleming's books, um, but, but they knew the stories from the films and they knew where the characteristics came from, they knew where the similarities were, and they were able to make those sorts of comparisons. And those are exactly the sorts of things they need to be able to do according to the, 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 the frameworks in the curriculum. I agree. I must go. I have homework to catch up on. And the class had a few questions of their own for Anthony Horowitz. Well, there will certainly be a seventh Alex Ryder book. At the moment, I don't have a plot, I don't have a title, I don't have any characters, and I don't have a setting. But otherwise, it's going very well. All the villains in my books are drawn out of the newspapers. I have to be very careful because of lawyers and stuff, but if you look in the press, there are always, every day, huge villains doing horrible things. I just borrow them and change their names. When the immensely busy Anthony Horowitz isn't writing children's fiction, he turns his hand to TV drama such as Foyle's War, tales of intrigue and double dealing in wartime Britain, which takes us neatly to the book our panel have been reading this week, Spies by Michael Frayne, a story of wartime espionage. The spies are two young boys, Stephen and Keith. Their adventure begins when Keith is led to suspect his own mother. The rest of our lives was determined in that one brief moment and Keith watched her walk away with a dreamy look in his eye that I remembered from the start of so many of our projects. My mother, he said reflectively, almost regretfully. 
He's a German spy. I thought this really, in some ways, was one of those books that was the self-enclosed world of the child, um, and in some way that, that's the cause of all the problems and the drama of the book. Yeah, I think that's probably a good way of putting it, actually, because you, you, you've got this, this very close friendship between Keith, who sort of holds the upper hand, and Stephen, who's sort of very slightly his sidekick and, and knows and feels that he's, he's rather inferior. And, and a lot of the book is about the sort of interplay between them, and then you've got all of these other people around them, their sort of mothers and fathers and, and relations and friends. But really, it's the, it's the unequal friendship between those two that sort of fuels the book. Another way to take the book is that it's really about the secret lives that go on inside families, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting, because you've got this middle-class family um, and their relationships juxtaposed against this sort of lower-class, not-quite nice family. It looks really well put together. It's, it's the um, nuclear family. Yes. But none of them talk to one another. Do you think there are any pointers in the book for, for us as teachers about how we treat children? Well, I've used this book um, in class. We read um, a short paragraph from the text, um, the actual part that ends with uh, Keith revealing his mother's a spy. Um, and we used it um, as to form part of a debate over the ch different children's feelings during wartime with that revelation. Um, so half the class looked at Keith's perspective, half the class looked at Stephen's perspective. Uh, I wouldn't actually use the rest of the text with Year 6 for various reasons. I think for Year 6 it's, it's a little too in-depth for them, but for Year 7 and 8 I think it would give a really good insight into childhood during the Second World War at uh, the home front. Mm. Grant? I think there's an awful lot in the book about bullying. I mean, the central character, Stephen, who's, who's um, relating the book, relating his mem memories of childhood as, as the, the narrator of the book. But it does actually, you get a sense of Stephen growing up during the book and, and, and getting a bit more sort of power and purchase, particularly over his friend Keith, but also about the rest of his life. When Stephen really needs support, there is nobody he can go to, there is no adult he can talk to about his yeah. feelings. We, need, we as educators need to enable children to do that. Now, we're supposed to think that Keith's mum is a spy, but um, there are a lot more mysteries go on in this book, aren't there? Yeah, nobody's quite who they seem, really. And, um, you know, we've got various heroes, and, and by the end of the book we find out that, that their lives are much more complex. You know, without giving away the ending, there's, um, there are spies there are spies in the close. Did you get the ending before it came? I did, actually, but, oh. but it's, I, I'd worked it out from, from, from just one phrase in, in the book, which made me think, but it's a brilliant twist. It's an absolute brilliant twist. Yeah, I think the author manages to hide it very, very well, um, so that you're concentrating so much on the boys and the mother and the family that you actually sort of skip over that evidence. So it's a very, very good twist. Well, that's it from reading aloud. Just time to return briefly to soccer. And it occurs to me that the potential to use the world of football as a learning tool is immense. Just think of the fun that can be had with those duff grammar and nonsense comments that players, commentators and managers find so easy to let slip. I'll leave you with one of my favourites, credited to the great Terry Venables. If history is going to repeat itself, I think we can expect the same thing again. Bye.